Well, this old boatyard is one of my favourite local places to visit. I love coming and looking across the river at these long forgotten boats and trying to imagine what the story is behind each of them. Each one will have a different purpose, a different crew. There will be many different stories attached to each boat. And as I was reading John chapter 21 verse 1 to 14, I thought, what about all the stories attached to the disciples' boats? In this passage, the disciples are once again fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Perhaps they were in Simon Peter's boat, or that of his business partners, James and John. Well, just imagine years later seeing their boat pitched up on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe it's now something of a wreck. But imagine hearing the stories of what it was used for, of who had been in it when wonderful things had happened. Perhaps it was the boat which Jesus stood in as he called his first disciples whilst the nets broke with the number of fish. Perhaps it was the boat that Jesus slept in as the storms raged on Galilee before he stilled them with a word. Perhaps it was the boat that the disciples were in as Jesus walked across the water to them. The boat Simon Peter stepped out of towards Jesus on the stormy waters. I just think of the stories of Jesus that were attached to the disciples' boats. But now this story is different, because in this story, it is the resurrected Lord Jesus who features. And the disciples find themselves once again in Galilee. Uh, we know from Mark's Gospel that Jesus had told his disciples that he would go to Galilee after his resurrection. But John, he doesn't record the reason for them being there. Instead, a lot of the focus seems to be on what they're doing. Peter has decided to go fishing. Once again, the disciples are back in the boat. It's a long night's fishing. And they've got nothing to show for it at the end. Then, as the morning sun was rising, a figure on the shore calls out to them and tells them to throw their nets out on the right side of the boat to find some fish. John tells us that it is the risen Jesus, but the disciples, they don't realise it's him. Yet, in obedience, they do as the figure has told them. And they catch such a huge haul of fish that they can't physically drag the net into the boat. Uh, this magnificent catch is enough for John, uh, here described as the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, to put two and two together. In verse 7, he quickly realises that it is Jesus who stands on the shoreline instructing their fishing. And he declares... It is the Lord. Uh, hearing John's words, Peter stops what he's doing. Uh, he jumps out of the boat and swims and wades his way to the shore to see Jesus. You sort of feel a bit sorry for the other disciples being left to sail the boat into shore uh, with a net full of fish dragging behind them. When in the, in the inset, it was Peter's idea, wasn't it, to go fishing in the first place. But there's something about his love for the Lord, uh, which compels him to be with the risen Jesus. It might have only taken an extra couple of minutes to sail the boat in uh, with the nets. But for Peter... Every minute with Jesus counts. I personally find Peter's action here really 
challenging? Uh, how strong is my desire to have time with the Lord Jesus? To spend time with him in prayer and as I read his word in the Bible. If I'm honest, I couldn't say that I jump out in the bed in, out of bed in the morning with half as much enthusiasm to spend time with Jesus as Peter had when he jumped out of that boat. Now you may be different, but I dare say many of us feel the same way. But rather than beating ourselves up for only managing a few minutes of prayer in a day and feeling guilty about it afterwards, let's instead focus on what drives Peter to be with Jesus. It's because he knows Jesus, because he loves him, because he has spent time in his presence before, that it means so much to him now. And that's what drives him to be with Jesus. And it's the same for us. Uh, any human relationship requires time and commitment. Uh, human friendships often start as get to know you introductions. But as the time spent together increases, so a deeper and more meaningful friendship grows. But that's not something that happens overnight, is it? Uh, so let us be finding space in our day to be with the Lord Jesus in prayer and as we read his word. Uh, we might not be ready to jump out of the boat by the second day, but with time and commitment, a deeper relationship and a greater love for the Lord Jesus will grow in us. Well, not long after the disciples reached the shore, uh, and what better sight to greet them than the risen Lord Jesus with a barbecued breakfast on the go. Uh, Jesus sends them in verse 10 to bring some of the fish they've just caught, and that's when in verse 11 we find out that there are 153 fish, large fish, filling the net. So now, a picture of the scene sometime later on the shore of Galilee. Uh, the disciples' boat lies there. And as you look at it, you, you think of the stories that the disciples had to tell. At the time when they were out fishing, and none other than the resurrected Lord Jesus reveals himself to them again. That's the boat. That's the boat that saw that miraculous catch of fish. A whole night on the water without a single catch, but in one instruction from Jesus. And the net is heaving with fish. That's the boat. So as the story is told, well, why mention 153? Now, there's lots of so all sorts of theories that play about with the numbers and try to find significance in them. But to be completely honest, I think it's simply another historical detail that John, the eyewitness, is able to record. After all, uh, which fisherman have you met who isn't proud to come home and give a detailed account of each one of his catches? Except for John recounting this, the huge quantity of fish doesn't serve to demonstrate the disciples' fishing capabilities. Quite the opposite, in fact. This great catch demonstrates the abundant provision of the resurrected Jesus for his disciples. In verse 12, uh, we read, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. And Jesus loves to feed his followers. And in verse 13 we see so clearly that it is Jesus who once again serves his disciples. Uh, Jesus came, uh, took bread and gave it to them. And did the same with the fish. Uh, they must have had many, many meals with Jesus during the time that they had 
following him. But this abundant provision would no doubt be bringing back memories of the time when Jesus fed the 5,000. The time uh, that this time, instead of the bread that is miraculously multiplied, it is the fish that is in plentiful supply. And here we are taught of Jesus' great commitment to feed his followers. Uh, shortly after the feeding of the 5,000, in John chapter 5, verse 51, uh, Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. His point is that we must receive him, receive what he has done for us on the cross. In that sense, we feed on him spiritually and in doing so, we live forever. And now, as Jesus feeds his disciples this wonderful barbecued breakfast, he has given his life so that we might have life. And he has risen again. He is living that resurrection life as proof to all who feed upon him that he shall keep his promise and they will live forever. So as we close, the question is, who will we turn to? Who will we turn to to feed us with this life-giving provision? I am personally so thankful for the NHS. I've had my life sustained by wonderful doctors and nursing staff. And I'm hugely thankful for all they're doing in this crisis. But we must not forget that it is only the resurrected Lord Jesus who is able to feed us with truly abundant, life-giving provision. And that's what this barbecue on the beach teaches us. It is only the resurrected Lord Jesus who gave his life so that by receiving him, we may have life forever. We must allow ourselves to be fed by Jesus. Let's pray now as we reflect upon that. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving your Son, for sending him Lord Jesus, we thank you for laying down your life that we may live, that you may give us abundantly a life, life eternal, life forever with you. And so, Lord, help us to feed upon you, to receive all that you have done for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.